Are we live, Benjamin? The broadcast is live. Yeah. Noah, it's so good to see you. It's been a while. You too. Yeah, it has been a while, hasn't it? So for everybody joining us, um, thank you. I want to introduce Noah. We're going to have a conversation. And um, if you have questions, you could put them, I think, into the chat or Q&A, and, and, and they'll be filtered into me, and we could and we could answer your questions as well. So Noah Tishby is an actress, an activist, a producer. She was ubiquitous on Israeli TV in the 90s. She came to America. She had an act she's an actress here and also pioneered um, Israeli TV in Hollywood selling in treatment. For years, Noah has also been an outspoken activist for Israel. And now you've written a book called Israel, a simple guide to the most misunderstood country on earth. And um, so welcome and thank you for doing this, Noah. Um, thank you, Gavin. I, I really, it's it's fortuitous. It's strange that we're doing this at this time because it's really a time when Israel is again in the news and it's a very fraught time. There's been, I think, seven Israelis killed um, since the beginning of the current conflict, including one child, 85 Palestinians killed, including at least 17 children, 1,800 rockets fired into Israel. There's been lynchings on the street in Israel. Um, I guess I want to start by talking about the, you know, what's going on. And and just to me, this feels not the same. This feels something very different about this. Is that your sense with the lynchings, with the civil unrest? It feels like a different time in Israel. Well, it's the same. It's just extreme. Uh, we've seen, obviously, we've seen periodically, we've seen Hamas firing missiles. Hamas has no intention of getting any resolution and was not happy with a unity government, with the uh, turning of Palestinians and uh, within Israel. Um, not, they're not into coexistence. They're they're into flaming the region consistently and framing Israel for it. Uh, there's also been some internal tensions every now and then. Um, the thing that is surprising for everyone is the um, the speed and velocity and ferociousness of how this whole thing exploded. Uh, I don't know when uh, this, uh, for the people who are watching us live, that's great. If you're watching it a little bit later or tomorrow, things may change. But as of 1 p.m. Pacific on Thursday, there has been nearly 2,000 rockets and missiles uh, thrown on Israel, three of them in the past half an hour from Hezbollah up in the north, which is very concerning. And um, um, and uh, and internal internal riots and lynching going on both by uh, Arabs on Jews and by, by Jews on Arabs that not killing, but um, property, um, and general and general mess. Um, my family has been in in and out of shelters. Again, this is not the first time this is going on, but the sheer level and speed and uh, the amount of rocket, like nearly two thousand rockets uh, in 72, 48, 72 hours. That I don't know if we've ever had that before. And the civil unrest, the part you were talking about with the lynchings, that feels different to me. That feels like. You have Israeli Arabs and Israelis, you know, killing each other, fighting with each other in the streets of Israel. We're not talking about the territories. We're not talking about Gaza. Does that yeah. feel different? It does feel different because it's happening a lot more. Again, we've seen this before. We've seen unrest within the uh, Jewish Israeli population and the Arab Israeli population. There are extremes who have uh, always been... Um, racist and fascist or anti-Semite or whatnot and have not been um, uh, happy with the, uh, what I call in the book, the almost seamless coexistence that have been happening in Israel for 73 years. So the life of, of Arabs and Jews, when you look at the numbers of 21, there, there's 21% minority of Arabs in Israel. They are 20.8% of all doctors and nurses in hospitals. They are in position of power in government, in the military and media and, and, and whatnot. And I always joke that almost every pharmacist you go to in super farm is, is an Arab Israeli. And it's, it's almost, it's not, it's not a problem. But the extremes on both sides are now stoking the flames and this is scaring everybody. So I want to make sure that we also hear the voices of common reason and all the people that are that are calling for calm, that are saying Yudim Varavim is Sarvim Yot of the of Oivim because it's there. But um it's very concerning. 
Do you think it's, is it social media feeding this? I mean, you, a lot of your activism takes place on social media, so it's a force for good, but now you're seeing that a lot of this looks like it's been fed through social media. A lot of it is. Uh, a lot of the uh, also rallying people and calling them, getting them to come to various places, cities and town to riot, to attack is happening on, happening on social media. And, um, Look, the, we know this about social media. It, uh, it it's a megaphone. A megaphone. It's a it, it makes everything louder and makes people on the fringes of the extreme that used to live in different towns and cities now be able to find each other and be like, oh, I hate X, Y, and Z too. Great to see a friend in the nearby town. So yeah, of course it's also social media. But um, look, there there are problems in Israel that are excuse me that are. Um, they're coming to the surface in Israel. And there are also problems within anti-Semitism and the anti-Zionism and anti-Israel sentiment in the US, which is coming out to the surface as well, which I've been warning about for over a decade. It's the reason I wrote this book. I've seen how the terminology and the, narr the narrative um, is shifting towards anti-Israel sentiments. I've seen it become um, confiscated by uh, the left, progressive left woke kind of terminology, and and uh, I, I've seen this as a problem that is that needs to be handled, and and literally now it's exploding in all of our faces. I mean, the level of anti-Semitism that we're all experiencing online right now is is shocking, shocking. When you, when you say, um, well, I, I guess first of all, uh, just in your, just to you. Uh, um, What's the greater danger to Israel? Is it that sense of anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, or is it the kinds of things that are causing this conflict happening in Israel? Like, where do you see the real existential threat to Israel? Well, in terms of uh, internationally, the, uh, Israel doesn't have, I always say this, and I say this a lot in, in within Israel, Israel doesn't have a problem. The only problem that it has is the Palestinian conflict, which needs to be resolved. I talk about this in the book. Um, this is actually not a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's an Israel-Arab world conflict. It's a wider conflict. It needs to be understood in that context. And um, when you read my book, it's not said so in so many ways, but you can kind of decipher what I think the biggest threat to Israel can be long term. Uh, it's probably internal. It needs to be resolved. There are a lot of people within um, within Israel that are. What do sorry? you mean by internal? What do you mean by internal? I don't want to necessarily. I think that um, I'm not even sure I should get into it because it's Why not, not? The time, because it's not the time right now. There's right now a real threat from the outside uh, and from within so from the from the outside from the outside and from within uh, but a real threat of a terrorist organization a lunatic genocidal islamist uh, organization that is calling for jihad and Sharia law that is throwing missiles and rockets onto israel right now and that's the worst problem that we can have right now so that is what needs to be brought to the focus israel as every country has its own problems and we'll need to resolve them but right now we need to make sure the world knows that we're dealing with one um not perfect yet the single consistent democracy in the middle east and hamas a terrorist organization so it's not there's no it's false equivalency you can compare the two and uh as i said on my social media yesterday it's literally it looks as if on 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 my, as I said on my Instagram, it looks as if my social media feed is uh, people are reciting talking points by Hamas. It's unbelievable. But there are, you know, in this case and in some other cases, I I'm wondering where you see the acceptable bounds of Israel criticism. Like, what are your the, the, the acceptable bounds of Israel criticism? Mm -hmm. A lot of mainstream commentators in Israel um, now, like, um, um, uh, you know, Shmuel Rosner and, and other people, people you know that are centrist or left of center, right of center, are saying that, you know, there's some blame to go around here on how Israel yeah. went ahead with what was going on in Sheikh Zara, how the Israeli police responded. These are inexperienced leaders in the Israeli police force right now, how Netanyahu kind of took his eye off the ball. In other words, that before Hamas started launching these rockets, which it hadn't done for a while, there were steps taken by Israel that didn't exactly help the situation. So, you know, when is the time to say what could Israel be doing differently? 
There, it's always the time to say that, um, but not while Israel's under attack. So I guess, no, there's not always the time. Right now, it's not the time to say that. Um, I'm all for criticizing uh, governments. I, and it's, again, it's very clear in my book that this is not a propaganda, an Israeli propaganda I'm, uh, book. It's, a, it's, it's quite balanced. And I, um, I just think that in general, the problem that we have in uh, in American media is that they think that if you want to support Palestinians, bash Israel. And that's literally like, I'm pro-Palestinian, therefore I'm just going to attack and attack and attack Israel. And what I say in the book is stop attacking Israel, it's not helping. Start empowering Palestinians. Find a way to actually empower them, to hold them accountable for, a, for a, 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 an accountable leadership, to get more finance into their economy in the PA and Ramallah, to get like strengthen them instead of literally jumping to the easiest conclusion, which is like, yeah, I'm super pro-Palestinian, I'm going to bash Israel again. That hadn't gotten us anywhere. It just hadn't gotten us anywhere. And the thing about Sheikh Jarrah and the, scene, the thing about... Um, the, the riots, I can you can trace down every one of these incidents and see like, all right, they acted wrong, they acted wrong in, on, in, in both. He's like, yeah, do we need to do X, Y, and Z? And did they need to do this? However, Hamas decided to confiscate this particular um, debate, which is over a contentious neighborhood, yet a neighborhood and a bunch of homes that have been uh, debated in civil courts for years, right? and use it for their own political gain. Like saying Al-Aqsa is in danger when there were riots within Al-Aqsa and they were throwing bricks out on prayers in the Wailing Wall and they were burning that tree. And then they burst in saying Al-Aqsa is in danger and like rallying up the troops and responding to that with 2000 missiles is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. So, you know, on one hand, we have a democracy that with inexperienced leaders in the police, with whatever, all of these, it's not that it's not true. It's just that comparing these two and taking like the response to it being, being those missiles is, is just unacceptable. It's a suicidal, genocidal organization, terrorist organization. They need to be stopped. They need to be called out, period, end of story. So much online, I see the criticism of Israel revolves around this idea of proportionate response. And <laughs> I have to say, um, and you're a mom, and I'm a dad, and it's a whole different thing when you see kids being hurt. It's a whole different thing. And now you have cell phones in the hospital rooms where you just are looking at these seven-year-olds, you know, devastated by Israeli um, missiles. And, you know, how do you respond to this, I, you know, to this very common criticism that Israel's responding disproportionately? It's horrible when children get it's, it's, I don't even need to say that. It's so, it's, I mean, it's, it's horrific. This war is costing um, both sides horribly and it's affecting the next generation. And it's, it, it, the, the cycle needs to stop. There's no question about that. Um, I would just again argue that a disproportionate respond to a police um, stopping riots and to a civil dispute over homes, disproportionate response is 2,000 missiles and rockets. That's what I would. That's what I would also argue. And again, I'm not defending. Um, I'm not defending the Israeli governments. They they've all made mistakes. But when you're dealing with an enemy who doesn't care to die, it's a lose lose situation. You can't win over that. And we know this, we know we know what Hamas is doing. We know Hamas is using human shields. The three first Palestinian children that were killed, they were killed by a, a, a rocket that exploded next to them, a Hamas rocket that exploded next to them. It wasn't even an Israeli attack. So this is horrible, but there's an organization there that is, I, it's like, I feel like I'm reciting talking points that we've all heard before, but we really need to kind of sit with the fact that they're putting ammunition under schools and under hospitals that they're forcing people to be human shields. Like this is actually happening and it's hard for Western society. It's hard for Americans to actually internalize that that is what we're dealing with. So they would say to me stuff like, no, come on, all of them, they just wanna live in peace. I'm like, no, not Hamas. No, really not Hamas, not Hamas, not those later, not those people. They don't care about human lives. In fact, they, they want more of them. And that, that is something, again, it's so difficult for Western people, like for, for all of us here to be like, no, that's impossible. Everybody just wants to live in Kumbaya. Not true. That region is difficult and it can't be judged by the same parameters in which we judge um, 
anything here in America. I just can't. So are there no kind of in your mind when, when people talk, I mean, there's no criticism that could be leveled for a so-called disproportionate response, like anything, anything goes when it comes to dealing with this evil that's Hamas. And I, and I agree that these are terrible people. I, uh, I did not say that. No, no, I know. I'm asking. I did not. <laughs> right. Not say that. But if you say, if you say that, that I will again say, how, what is a, what is a proportionate response to 2000 rockets? I just don't know what it is, you know? Um, thank God I'm not a military person, but I really don't know what it is. It's very easy to sit here in the United States and be like, come on, be proportionate. And it's like, you try sitting under 2000 missiles and you'd be like, F you, like level you all. Like that's just, it's like, it's a human reaction. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a puzzling, it's a puzzling question. There is no proportional or disproportionate reaction to, to 2000 missiles. You just do what you got to do to defend yourself and to, and to protect, protect yourself, your family and your people. When the other side doesn't, I'm not talking about the entire Palestinian people, obviously I'm talking about Hamas controlling Gaza. They don't care. Your book goes a lot into the history and, um, and, and I love the way it's written. It's got this kind of like very, just like we're talking now, it's very conversational. Um, and then I, I sometimes wonder, like, at the end of the day, how much does history matter? How much does they're right about this? We're right, you know, like they did this, we did it. Like, isn't it really about going forward? What do we do? How much does the history really matter? Like every, like the internet is full of like, I used to joke with the minute say one fact about Israel, how long it takes for this thread to go down to 1948, you know, or 1897, like it just. All the way to the stew of lentil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, let's go all the way there. Why not? Uh, look, I, I, I mean, history matters. Look at every social justice movement from Black Lives Matter to the Women's March. And you can't tell any of these social justice movements, don't worry about history. Let's just think forward. Does that make sense? I mean, history matters. I well, you know, let's, yeah, let me not yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. BLM, okay? Let's not talk about BLM because I'm not, I shouldn't t speak to that. Although they will tell you that what happened in history in the United States does matter when it comes to reparation and thinking about moving forward and all that, you've got to look back. Um, but even the women, you know, the women movement, it's not like I can be like, oh, stop it. You, you don't just get discriminated anymore. You used to, but you're not property anymore. And I'm like, yeah, but hang on a second. Let's look at structural and let's look at the patriarchy and let's look at who's the gatekeeper and why are they the gatekeeper? Like there's, you have to learn from the past in order to create a future. You have to. But do you have to, do you have to agree about the past? Because I, I feel like we'll never agree about the past. I mean, well, Israel's Independence Day is their Nakba, and the experience, the live. It's like, you know, it's like a couple in a bad marriage. They will never agree on who said what when. But how do you move forward? That's fine. I'm. I'm. I think that essentially you're right. But the conversation of the past of history and the claims of colonialism and the claims of whatever, the claims the Holocaust never happened, all these claims are damaging the future. So I was like, let's just kind of like look at what happened and, and stick to history for a second for those who know and for those who don't know it. Now we can talk about creating a future. And I end the book very clearly on that. This is about, the book is about a possibility for the future. The book is for my son. The book is for him his kids. Like, this is about what are we creating in the future? What's possible there? Okay, we've done all that great, put in the past, but first we need to discuss it. When I talk to people and they don't even know how we got to this place, you can't create a past without actually seeing what happened up to now and, you know, move forward. Speaking of talking to people, what's, what's the biggest misconception you come across when you're doing this kind of activism in the, in the world? I mean, I think what's so interesting about you and your career is that you bridge a lot of different worlds, Israeli, American, Hollywood, activism. It's just, you're, you're the bridge. So, and, and I think- I'm a that, you know, troubled water right now, I can tell you that. Well, it's also, you know, a lot of people trample on bridges. So that's what they're there for, to be walked on. So how do you, uh, how do you, like, what are the biggest misconceptions about Israel that you find out there? Where do you start? Um, so I'll, I'll touch on the obvious ones that we've all, I'm sure, heard. Uh, Israel being a apartheid state, colonialist state, um, Israel not granting uh, rights, Israel being religious. A lot of millennials think Israel is a super religious country. 
Um, but um, I'm just going to share a little story that literally just happened in one of the crazy clubhouse rooms that I that I run. We had uh, what, the reason I love uh, clubhouse. One of the reasons I love clubhouse is that we, I I bring a lot of um, a lot of um, Arabs from the region, a lot of Palestinians. Opinions onto stage and have this kind of authentic debate and sometimes argument and and so on with them. Uh, there was a guy named Hamid that just came. Uh, is from Iran and he asked me. He was like, "So is it true that like Arab Israel like they don't have rights? Is it true that?" And I basically told. And it's like, "When are the Arab Israelis going to get rights in Israel and citizenship?" And I'm like, "Or or can they ask for it?" And I'm like, "They don't need to ask for it. They have it." And his brain just went, bzz, bzz. he's like, what do you, what do you mean? I'm like, they, they have it. And I just told him about the reality of, of um, Arab Israeli, Palestinian Israeli within the green line. And like that, you know, that you go to Israel and everything is written in he Hebrew and in Arabic. And that, you know, the whole thing about the doctors and nurses. And I talk about that in the book, how the Israeli um, um, president was sentenced to jail by a presiding Arab judge and, and, Having a uh, uh, and I read, he's like, I was taught in school that Israel's out to get us. I was taught in school that X, Y, and Z, you know, all this propaganda. I was told, in, you know, he he was born and raised in Iran, so that's like probably the, the as worse as it gets. But um, so it's misconceptions that we have here in America. Um, all these misconceptions that we've all heard as like Americans, <laughs> but then the misconceptions of the Arab world are even way more way more extreme, and that just happened. So. It was just really nice to have that conversation with him and tell him all these th things. And he was like, oh, well, thank you so much. I, I actually didn't know that. So. Um, so you're getting, you're bringing in Palestinians, you're bringing in people with these very different points of view and having these sort of raw conversations. Yeah. Wow. Very much so. The other day, two days ago, um, when the conflict was was brewing, when Tel Aviv was starting to get hit, and I started getting all these frantic calls from my sisters, I was so distraught. I called my uh, co-hosts, uh, Danielle Ames Spivak and Shani Suisa, and I was like, we have to start a room. We have to start a room. We have to start a room. We started a room at 11 o'clock in the morning, and we closed it at 12.30 at night. We ran the room for 13 and a half hours. We didn't have less than a thousand people on stage at all time. And we had at the end of the day, 52,000 people going through the room. It was the biggest room on Clubhouse this week by a, by like triple digits. And we right. held space and we, we had all these conversations. We had a lot of Palestinians. We had a lot of people who were like attacking me and, and all of us and, and I, it's it's fun. I can I can hold my own. I'm like, don't talk to me this way. If you want to be respectful, we're gonna have a respectful conversation. Like it's very like military commander. Like we're having an honest, authentic conversation here. Don't you get all like that on me? And it worked. It was it was incredible. It was extraordinary. I think. Um, I mean, maybe the lesson of that is we all are in our silos. Like the pro community is in this kind of echo chamber. The anti. Israel community is in its echo chamber and you kind of pierce that through clubhouse is a very- The bridge. Place. Listen, I, I, the bridge, yeah, right. I step into clubhouse and I walk into Palestinian rooms and anti-Zionist rooms. And I, I walk into these rooms and I get constantly kicked out and blocked from them. Constantly. Every single time. I have yet to be able to be in a, in a, a pro-Palestinian um, room, which is funny because I'm pro-Israeli, but also pro-Palestinian. So why are they making it mutually exclusive? God knows, right? I guess that's the liberal thing to do. Um, but I was like, I've yet to be in a pro-Palestinian room in which I didn't get kicked off of stage. That just never happened. And I, that's what I said to the people on stage. Um, at some point there was a guy I was speaking to, his name was Muhammad. And he said to me, oh, and thank you so much, you guys, for having so many Muhammads on stage. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'm committed to not doing what they do to me every time I try to walk in a room and be, you know, I walked in the room the other day of, um, sorry, what happened? Is everything okay? You lost audio? What happened? Oh, you lost my audio? I am on, you're off. Rob, is that what you're saying? Hi guys, I made, can't hear. I made, oh. You can hear me? You're on. You're saying you can hear both. Rob, did, can you not hear me? 
so Rob can't hear me. Hi guys, uh, welcome to the forward. We are uh, um, having a uh, technical what? difficulties. Um, so am I now on? Benyamin, uh, help. Can you hear? Are you here? Are you back, Rob? The conference. Okay, help. All right. Uh, on. We can hear both. He's saying we can hear both. Rob, try logging off and logging back in. Rob, I'll hold space. How many people do we have here on our live show at the moment? Noah, tell us a story. Um, we have 50 people. Hi, everybody. This is uh, this is Noah, and we're having technical issues. I want to tell you something else about, um, what was I going to tell you about Clubhouse? Um, yes, I was going to tell you that the other day I walked into a room that it was before that conflict started, but I walked into a room that was about the French hijab ban, and they were asking if this is um, Islamophobic or legit. And I was sitting in the audience, and a lot of uh, French women were talking about, and a lot of Muslim women were talking about their experiences, and I found it fascinating. Um, they were talking about, uh, hi, Rob, I'm telling them a story right now. Um, they were right. talking about their... You're welcome. Um, their experience in uh, with the ban with the hijab ban, and there were a lot of women there that were sharing that they want to wear a hijab. Now, I have my own opinion about um, a hijab or any kind of head cover for women, really, from any religion or any doctrine. I, if you're, I just don't think that we should disrespect men that much. Like, if you guys can't handle hair, then you know this is would, would be disrespectful for me to think that you can't handle hair. But that's just my opinion. But I was really interested in hearing that point of view, and I asked to get on stage, and they got me on stage, and I wanted to say thank you for sharing and how beautiful it is that I'm able to hear these points of view from um, Arab women that I don't really usually get to share. And of course, within two seconds, they realized that I'm Israeli and they kicked me off the stage and they blocked me from the room. So I didn't even get a chance to say that. So having said that, um, my um, um, desire is to continue continuing to be that bridge, Rob, that you were talking about, whether on Clubhouse or um, in the world. And that's legitimately why I wrote this book. Hi, Rob, are you back? I'm back, I'm sorry about that. I don't know. Okay. I was uh, I was told to tell tell us a story, so I was I I told you guys a story. Sure. <laughs> if anybody could handle the stage without me, it's you. Fine, I've done enough live events and got stuck with a lot of. Uh, can I tell you another? Yeah, I've done. Um, anyway, I've done a, the I, live. I, so, I was so moved by or, or perturbed by that story. I think I read in the Times of Israel about a friend of yours who texted you after your appearance on the View and said he couldn't be friends with you because you're an Islamophobe. Yeah. And I, and I do think you make clear in the book, first of all, that you really do understand the Palestinian plight in the West Bank. It's not good to be a Palestinian in the West Bank. It's not good to be a Palestinian in Gaza. It's the worst to be a Palestinian in Gaza. And I have heart. Um, and, and that ultimately to be pro-Israel is to be pro-Palestinian. I mean, you would agree with that, I'm assuming. That sure. If you want what's what's good for the people, you know, like a marriage, if it's good for you, it's good. You know, you can't live in the same area if one of you is miserable. Um, and yet I don't think you're this guy who texted you who said, I can't be friends with you because you're Islamophobe. How do you how do you confront that? I mean, what, did you reach out to him? Did you say, well, what's, you know, or is that? I actually just didn't. Lost? I actually didn't. Um, by the way, I'm having this like reflection on my face for some for some reason. It's annoying me, so it's probably annoying the the viewers. No, no, it's fine. I uh, I actually didn't. That uh, that guy, I've been uh, having issues with him and his positions for many many years. I uh, God, this thing. What is that? Do you see it? No, no, no. It's fine. I have like a little alien on like light alien on my face. Um, that particular guy is he's a he's a, a a dear person that has all the right intentions and zero knowledge. Uh, by the way, not only on Israel, he has the same zero knowledge in a lot of other countries in the world, and he's been very active in in various fields um, and various international fields. And and um, some people can be swayed, and some people are so far in the deep end that I just didn't engage. I just didn't answer. It broke my heart, and I didn't answer. I sent that text message to a, a few of our mutual friends. They were all like, I didn't even need to say who I, who I got um, that text message from. All I needed to do was, you know, look at what I got, and they were like, oh, it's, it's them again. I'm like, yeah. So I didn't, I actually didn't engage anymore. anymore. I may, I may, look, he, he said, um, it's a ray of sun. Maybe it's a ray of sun. Let me try and move the sun. Uh, he, um, 
there's no, there's some, some people you just, and just for people who don't understand that, that, that don't know the story, the backstory and the story of the, the times of Israel. I, um, after my appearance on, on the view with the Megan McCain, um, saying that anti-Zionism is anti, anti-Semitism, which I stand by. Uh, he basically texted me saying that if like, if you continue saying that, uh, you're, there's no more room for people like me in your life. Basically, I'm not gonna be a friend anymore. And I was like, okay, but that's fine. If he doesn't want to be my friend, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we, all, we all lost some friends in this uh, throughout the years because of this. Yeah. So you know, with the anti, I, I don't know where I come down that necessarily is a hard and fast rule. I know that many Israel, many Jews are anti-Zionist. In fact, in the beginning of Zionism, m most leading Jewish organizations were anti-Zionist, like the yeah. American Jewish Committee. Because, um, Zionism, because Zionism was such a radical concept that people are like, no, 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 no. And also they were concerned about the, the governments of, of places they were living in. That's why the first Zionist Congress was very specific in issuing a statement, the first statement that they issued, that they all the Jews will live accordingly to the rules of the countries in which they're at. Like they, they right. it was a very right. dangerous, radical political movement. So obviously they were against it. And also they just didn't think it was going to happen. I guess I'm just more, I, I just feel like it's more clear to me that if you're anti, if you want Israel to disappear, then that's necessarily anti-Semitic because it's just saying I want to kill 6 million Jews and it's, it, it, it's 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 batty. It's like saying I want right. to be here. Um, so, what I say in the book is: Can you can you can you um, can you unconsciously couple uh, destruction of a state from destruction of the people who live in it? How much of a you're right within Hollywood? How much of a um, how much of a price do you pay, or what are the, what are the kind of penalties for being? pro-Israel in your sense. I, we saw what happened with Gal Gadot when she tweeted something that was, to my mind, pretty mild, pretty nice, pretty humanistic. I want both sides to live in peace and harmony. It doesn't seem- How like dare she? So- How dare she? Right. Say that she wants everybody to live in peace. Ugh. I mean, did you understand where, from the other point of view, from the people who attacked her, what? what would have been the right thing to tweet like of course I mean, not of course not there's no right way, like there's no right way to tweet about israel unless it's negative against israel just because of the sheer volume listen one bella hadid has three times the followers as the entire population of jews in the world okay but then like, how, you, but how do you explain noah the Americans are overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Like for all the Bella Hadids and all the worry about, you know, BDS, which is a, you know, most Jews are, I think the last poll showed that 44, 46% of Jews didn't even know what BDS was. I mean, uh, for all that, you know, Israel is a very popular country in this country. Um, how do you explain that? It's not really, because when you look at the numbers and you start breaking them down to age groups, it's become Darkingly different. So when you look at millennials and below, the the I think it goes down from I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's in my book and the recent uh, and the recent right. research. It like drops dramatically. So the support for Israel is from a certain age and above, right, and from a certain political um, affiliation and above. So obviously, if you're an evangelical, you are automatically supporting Israel. But if you are a uh, millennial. You're a little on the fence, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, obviously more problematic with the Democrats. So um, millennials put Israel uh, in third place in the world in religion after Saudi Arabia and Iran. So they think that it's adds religion as third, to, like first is Iran, then Saudi Arabia, and then Israel. is really, Like they have no understanding and the support is winding down, like as, as the age go become younger. So I disagree that overwhelmingly people in America support Israel. That's actually not, that's well, no. not true. It's a certain Overwhelming, generation. Overwhelmingly they do, but you're right. Statistically, when you break it down, Numbers. it's not overwhelming among millennials. Yes. It's not overwhelming among parts of the Democratic Party, parts of the uh, other groups, but it's- um, Millennials are growing up, you know? That's the problem. I'm warning of something that's happening and that's it's a it's a it's a shift that's been happening for a long time. And it's an, it's a generational shift that's happening. Problematic. It's very problematic. 
you know, there's this thought that how effective is, um, you know, all the good news about Israel. Like there was this, you know, there were these campaigns to promote Israel's water usage and its gay rights and it's, you know, it's Hollywood, it, it's movies, it's TV shows. Does that, is that effective in the long run, in the short run, or is that, you know, one war and it just seems to kind of wipe that out? It's only affecting in times of calm. It's affecting in time, it's effective in times of calm. When, um, when the when war is happening like today it's all out the window nobody cares they go to their original uh subconscious biases about jews and about israel that's where they go automatically so we need to hold calm as much as possible and continue telling the world the contribution that israel gives to the world right and what it does in terms of charity and innovation and blah 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 the fashion food all these all these fields but when when this is going on um we need to handle this it's acute so mm -hmm. so just to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation then i'll let you go um what what we what a lot of commentators are saying we're seeing is these extremists these extremist factions the extremist jews in the streets beating up arabs um you know chanting in praise of the bombs falling in gaza which nobody in their right mind would actually be happy to see the death and destruction there um and then you have of course hamas and the extremists on the other side so i mean do you feel like it's just heading into this kind of hopeless you know the extremes you're not an extreme person obviously um so do you see hope for kind of the liberal vision of zionism that your grandfather and your mother who sounds like an amazing woman um do you see hope for that kind of vision in israel yes i do i definitely do Tell I, me, I, I need to hear it. Tell me. How do you see it? There are a couple of things that need to change and alter, um, specifically with the education within the ultra orthodox um, system. I think that is one of the major things that need to change core curriculum. Um, and I think the majority of Israelis still want to live in peace. They still want to coexist. They still want to uh, adhere to culturally Jewish, secular kind of uh, way of living. And um, because of the um, geopolitical situation that Israel's is at in terms of its enemies, and because of the internal political situation Israel's having, because of <clears throat> various issues that are happening with, with the uh, government, um, and obviously COVID and, and <laughs> like a world and a year and a half of a world in pandemic, right now we're at a standstill. But I'm, I'm optimistic at the end of the day. I really am. Israel's a miracle. It's a miracle, and it's going to continue being a miracle, hopefully for uh, you know many many years to come. Okay, well, um, everybody, check out Noah's book, Israel: A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth. We're all going to join your fifty thousand member clubhouse. And, um, it wasn't a member; they were just listening in the room. Right, fifty thousand listener, um, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you for putting up with my technical difficulties. Thank you so much for joining me today, Noah. Thank you so much for having me, Rob. Okay, talk to you later.